In early 2026, these four humans, Jeremy, Victor, Christina, and Reed, will be the first to fly on this spacecraft on top of this rocket. And for the first time in more than 50 years, humans will see the far side of the moon with their own eyes. But before this Orion spacecraft is placed on top of this Space Launch System rocket, there was an integration process that took more than two years to complete. This is the story of how this rocket came to be. We'll start long before any components were brought into the vehicle assembly building. Rather, our story starts with a train rumbling down the tracks in September of 2023. It traveled from Utah across eight states to deliver the 10 segments of the solid rocket boosters manufactured by Northrop Grumman. These will provide about 75% of the initial thrust of the rocket at liftoff. That same month, over at the Michoud Assembly Facility in Louisiana, crews were busy installing the four RS-25 engines onto the base of the SLS rocket's core stage. Three of the four RS-25 engines carry Space Shuttle heritage, including engine 2047, which was used on STS-135, the final shuttle flight. Engine integration was completed by the end of September, but it would wait until the following summer before it was shipped to Florida. Back at KSC on October 19, 2023, the Orion crew and service modules were joined together inside the Neil Armstrong Operations and Checkout Building. Over the next couple of months, the solid rocket booster segments were offloaded from their train cars and the aft pieces were brought into the rotation, processing and surge facility. In October, the aft skirts were mated to the aft segment of the boosters. That was followed up by the addition of the nozzles heading into December of 2023. A month later, January 24, came with a big change to the timeline. Safety is our top priority. And to give Artemis teams more time to work through the challenges with first-time developments, operations, and integration, we're going to give more time on Artemis 2 and 3. So what I want to tell you is we are adjusting our schedule to target Artemis II for September of 2025 and September of 2026 for Artemis III. That adjustment was, in part, to better understand the impacts to the heat shield on Orion during the re-entry period on the Artemis I mission back in 2022. When we talk about understanding root cause and what's causing this gas buildup that created some, some uh, uh, pieces that came off during, in the char layer, we, we really understood what the phenomenon is physically, and we were able to replicate that on the ground. And that's a big difference. That's a huge swinger for us from a crew safety perspective. Once we can replicate on the ground, we know what the phenomenon is. And we said, hey, you know, if you fly a, a, a limited trajectory and you don't do a skip guidance like we did on Artemis 1, which we don't need to do for Artemis 2, you're going to get this uh, very safe way to come home and still land off the coast of San Diego. And so those two pieces were huge in terms of our ability to say, hey, we have a heat shield that's ready for crew to fly. Things were quiet on the stacking front until July of 2024. That was when the Boeing-built core stage of the rocket arrived on the Pegasus barge after traveling nearly 900 miles from Michoud in Louisiana. The 212-foot-long core stage slid out of the barge and rolled on into the VAB. Once there, it remained in the transfer aisle while High Bay 2 was being prepared. The launch vehicle stage adapter was also offloaded from the barge around the same time. Meanwhile, after several months of testing at Launch Complex 39B, the Mobile Launcher 1 was rolled back into High Bay 3 in early October 2024. That allowed stacking to truly begin. First up was the left booster's aft section, skirt, and nozzle that were hoisted into place in early November. That was followed days later by the first big section of the right booster. Another big schedule change came on December 5th. That was when NASA leadership held a press conference to announce that the Artemis 2 and Artemis 3 missions were being delayed again. But this time, it was to no later than April 2026 and no earlier than mid-2027, respectively. Officials said this was both to allow the learnings from the heat shield analysis to be incorporated and to adjust based on the readiness of hardware for both missions. Sometimes in space, uh, delays are agonizing and, and slowing down is agonizing and it's not, like, what, not what we like to do. But from the crew perspective, the thing that we most asked our leadership for after Artemis 1 was root cause of the ablation of the heat shield. And we took the time. This was very, very open process 
The crew certainly never felt like there was a door closed to us. We never saw any hidden data. It was all open. It was all open discussion. We had an independent review team uh, with a lot of outside experts and internal experts to look at this. So we really appreciate the willingness to take the risk to actually slow down and understand root cause, determine the path forward, corrective action for Artemis II and Artemis III, so that when Victor, Christina, Jeremy, and I launch and land after a successful Artemis II, we will look to Artemis III to carry the torch forward and to put humans back on the moon, and that is really our ultimate objective. Then in early December, the core stage was hoisted from the transfer aisle and carefully lowered into high bay two to allow SRB stacking to continue. On December 16th, during an industry day inside the VAB, Amit Kshatriya, who was the deputy associate administrator for the Moon to Mars program at the time, talked about the improvements made to the integration flow for Artemis II versus Artemis I. We spent a lot of time um, dispositioning the, heart, the, the Orion. We spent a lot of time working on process improvements here. I believe we have taken a lot of the risk out of the, out of the integration flow here, out up front, because of the, the time we've been working on getting the, the development activity done for two. So I think it's very realistic. In fact, I want the crew, and we said it during the conference, I want to roll the stack out at the end of the year. And I want to set a date earlier than, than April because I want to challenge this team to do that. We have got to get, we have got to get our launch probability up. We, the, it's going to be very difficult to launch this vehicle given the constraints that we put on it from the from the from the interrogation of the, the heat shield. So, and that's a good thing because trying to launch this vehicle for the third mission when we have to go meet Starship and Lunar Orbit is going to be really really tough. And so, the better we can get, we can get it at meeting those commitments, meeting those stacking timelines. That in and of itself is an organizational test objective that I want to put onto the, onto the team. So what I tell you is I have confidence that these guys are ready to go do it. Now we're going to run into problems. Of course we are. That's just the name of this business. It's, I mean, if you look at the size and scale of the machine behind me and then all the other parts that have to come together, absolutely. But I, I think that this team can do it. That same day, we caught up with Lorna Kenna, who was the program manager of Momentum's space operations division at the time. That's the company who managed the integration of the rocket. Today, we actually moved the left aft center segment over here to prepare for stacking. We'll do some prep work and then that'll actually go up and over on Wednesday. It's about 90 days or three months to get us through the full stacking where we'll go left, right, left, right as we make our way up the stack. True to her word, SRB stacking continued into the new year with the two forward segments added in early February. Those were followed closely by the nose cone assemblies about a week or so later to complete the twin solid rocket boosters. In mid-March, the core stage was hoisted from its temporary home in High Bay 2 before being lowered into the transfer aisle by one of the five overhead cranes in the VAB. On March 23rd, the 212-foot-long stage was lifted once again to be carefully nested between the twin solid rocket boosters in High Bay 3. On April 3rd, Teams hoisted the launch vehicle stage adapter into place atop the core stage. It's designed to protect the avionics and electrical systems on the upper stage, along with providing structural support. Speaking of the upper stage, the interim cryogenic propulsion stage was added to the rocket stack on May 1st. Built principally by United Launch Alliance in partnership with Boeing, the ICPS is powered by a single RL-10 engine. A few days later on May 5th, the Lockheed Martin-built Orion spacecraft left the Operations and Checkout Building to head to the Multi-Payload Processing Facility, or MPPF. There, it would undergo a series of checkouts, as well as being loaded with propellant alongside other necessary gases and fluids that support the crew for their 10-day mission. Fast forward to August 10th, Orion's next road trip took it from the MPPF to the Launch Abort System Facility, or LASF. There, it would be integrated with the 44-foot-tall launch abort system that is comprised of the launch abort tower and the fairing assembly. Later that month on August 19th, the Orion stage adapter arrived at KSC after a nearly 700-mile long road trip from NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama. That component helps protect Orion from flammable gases during launch, and it also plays host to four CubeSats that will be deployed after stage separation. 18-foot diameter adapter was then lifted onto the rocket stack on September 29th. Finally, on October 17th, Orion, outfitted with the launch escape system, rolled out from the LASF to the VAB, and two days later, 
It was stacked atop the rest of the rocket. And with that, NASA had a fully assembled space launch system rocket, the launch vehicle for the Artemis II mission. Coming up next, roll out to the pad. Reporting for Space Flight Now, I'm Will Robinson-Smith.